I want to conclude my, my kind of mini three-week series on God is from God is the Father, God is the Son, and now this morning, God is the Spirit. Uh, I don't see them as, much any, as often anymore, but I can remember growing up, I would see like the bumper stickers uh, that God is my co-pilot bumper sticker. And it never quite sat right with me. I was like, I don't know, it just didn't quite sound right to me until I saw the bumper sticker. This was just a couple years ago. That I'm like, oh, that's why it doesn't make sense to me. Their bumper sticker said, if God is your co-pilot, switch seats. That makes a lot more sense to me. If God is your co-pilot, you better switch seats. All right? God should be the one that is guiding and directing. Uh, and when I think about the Holy Spirit... Uh, when I think about the Holy Spirit, what I think so often it, uh, His role and His purpose in our life of God and directing is to illuminate the things of God that maybe we wouldn't have naturally in our flesh have recognized. When we did the trunk or treat last night, we realized that one of the, the light posts right out here uh, was dark. We couldn't see anything. All right? And because we couldn't see anything, it was actually really complicated in that area. They're trying to play little games. I know Amanda's game had these little black bats that you had to throw into this little hole. Like everything was, the whole car was black and the bats were black. You couldn't see anything. The car is black. The, the asphalt's black. You couldn't see anything. All right? And if the light was there, it would have illuminated what it is that they were trying to do. All right? And that's what, that's what the Holy Spirit's role is, to make visible which would otherwise be hidden in darkness. And uh, w when I think about what the Holy Spirit can actually do in our life, I'm going to make a couple bold statements. I think what the Holy Spirit can actually do in our life when we really begin to say, I want to be yielded to the Holy Spirit, I think stress will go down, our hope will go up, I even think debt can go away, and I know lives will be changed. And I'll share what I mean by that. Let's start by looking in John chapter 16. John chapter 16, there's several passages throughout Scripture that describe the Holy Spirit, uh, and this is one of them. And in John 16, look at the first few verses, it says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus talking. It is to your advantage that I go away, for I do not go, if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. And I think that's always tough for us because we're like, man, I would much rather have Jesus right here. I would much rather have Jesus on earth. Like, he could come and weigh in on our presidential uh, debate right now. Like, well, let's put what Jesus thinks. All right? That we could, we could be asking him questions. We could go and visit him. All right? Find out all, the, like, all these questions that we have in, in theology and all these questions we have about the Bible, all these questions we have about life, we can go and ask Jesus. But Jesus says it's to his advantage, it's to our advantage that he leaves and that we get the Holy Spirit, the helper, instead. And when you really think about it, it does begin to make sense. I mean, when you start multiplying, you know, into the millions, that there are millions of believers, and if you just simply talk about the line that would take place in order to hear a word from Jesus... All right, the line would be insane. All right, you, would be, you would basically start waiting in line right when you cared, right when you cared enough, maybe you're 14, 15 years old, you start waiting in line, you would never see him. You'd be dead before you got to the front of the line. All right, you don't realize when you start taking 500 million people, multiplying it by two minutes, you get two minutes with Jesus. All right, that, that's still, that's your whole lifetime. You can't, you wouldn't even be able to see him. And Jesus is saying, it's to your advantage. Instead of me being in one place in one time, I can be everywhere all the time. That the Holy Spirit can be in you and with you every moment of the day. When you talk about how can I know what God wants in my life? How can I know that God hears me? How can I know that God cares for me? It's because the Holy Spirit is in you. God gave you his very own spirit. God himself is with you every moment of the day. This is God with us multiplied. This is in every single believer. He goes on in verse 8 to say, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin 
and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Uh, there's a couple things that I, I even looked at the last time I preached this passage. Um, it was several years ago. I was up at Hope Baptist. And, and I, I preached it, I mean, I wouldn't say like totally incorrectly, but I, I think I, I missed an important nuance. All right, and the important nuance that I did, I, I, I just had somebody question me about this a couple months ago, and it got me really studying and really researching. Like, if you were to ask me, like, what is the Holy Spirit's role in our life? I think one of the first things I would have said right off the bat would have been, it convicts us of sin. But when you really look at what this passage says, all right, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and it's going to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That the convicting of sin is when it's talked about that this is what he's going to do to the world to lead people to Jesus Christ. So I can just tell you from there, if you search the rest of the New Testament, you won't find a passage that says that the Holy Spirit then goes on to convict believers of sin. Uh, I wouldn't say that like I would come down strong and say, no, 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 the Holy Spirit does not do that. If I were to just kind of play, you know, well, when, how, how are we convicted of sin? I think it's because God gave us a new nature, and we now understand the Bible as his word, and as we read the word, we will see where we are not living up to God's standards, all right? And that brings conviction, because we know who God is, we know who his word is, we know the changing that God has put in our life. It's almost like that's not a role we need for the Holy Spirit. And the fact of that the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin, leading us to say, I need a Savior. We come to know Jesus as our Savior. And now his role is, now I want to make you more Christ-like, which again, in many instances, is setting aside sin and following Christ more closely. But it doesn't seem that's his role. So when I really look at what his role is, it, I, I try to start thinking, what is my role as a Christian, my role as a believer, interacting with this world. If the Holy Spirit's role is to convict people of sin, is that then my role to convict people of sin? And what I generally say is, no, I don't think as believers that we are trying to con convict unbelievers of individual sin. I do believe her role is to help them understand that they are sinners. To help them see that they are sinners in need of a Savior, the Holy Spirit himself specifically dealing with the individual sins. And I think if we bring up individual sins to people before they're asking, now if it's a scenario that they're asking like, well, what does the Bible say about this? Beautiful, open door, this is what the Bible says. But until they're asking those kind of questions, until they're really beginning to see themselves as sinners in the hands of an angry God, many times they are just going to get defensive Many times, they're just going to put up an outer wall to say, oh, you, you Christians are always just judging me based on, you know, whatever you think is right. And, and the, that's because it's really, it's not our role to convict them of individual sin. That's what the Holy Spirit begins to do in unbelievers' lives, is point out the things that they are doing are wrong. Again, I think it's actually really neat, even when people invent their own morality even when they you know because you're either going to believe in what the bible says or you're going to be inventing your own and even when you invent your own morality people break their own morality people break their own rules and what they say is right and wrong and the holy spirit can use that to convict them of their sin i agree a hundred percent we need to be there to help them see that they are sinners but the holy spirit's role is to convict them of sin nor do I think we're supposed to point out the things that they're not doing. Pointing out to people, oh man, you're, listen, of course you're, you're a horrible person. You don't go to church. Of course you're a horrible person. You don't, you don't do this. You don't give to the poor. You don't give these. How can they begin to understand that they're supposed to be doing good, righteous things for the Lord if they don't know who Jesus is? If they don't know who God is, how could they begin to see the things, the, the right and wrong things they are supposed to do. The Holy Spirit is the one that points out the things that they're doing wrong. Our role is to point them to Jesus. Our role is to say, hey, I want to introduce to you 
the, the Lord and Savior who has radically changed my life. Peter talks about when people ask you, why do you seem to have hope in this hopeless world? Why do you seem to have joy in this joyless world? Why do you seem to have peace in this chaotic world? That we're always ready to share the reason for the hope that is in us. So when people begin to ask us, why... Why do you do good? Why don't you do this? Why do you do this? Why do you talk different? Why do you give money to that? All right, so it's so easy to just kind of give a, a kind of a fakeish answer. Ah, you know, I don't. I like to. I like to help people. But let's be specific and say, you know what? God has been so good to me. I want to bless other people because God has shown me what it's really like to live good, a good and righteous life. I try to do my best to live that way all the time. We put Jesus at the forefront of the reason why we live the way we live. Instead of pointing out what they're doing, of the, what they're not doing, let the Holy Spirit begin to convict them of that. Uh, and lastly, when it comes to, to judgment, you know, most people believe, like when you really press them, they, they deep down in their souls, they want this to be true. They want really evil people to be punished beyond what this world can do. All right, deep down, when you really ask them, they want the really evil, like the Hitlers and the politicians of the world, that they receive ultimate judgment one day. All right, and our role is not, all right, to point out to them, all right, that all the different ways that God is going to punish. They, many people in themselves, they view themselves as good, all right, many people view themselves as, yes, I believe that people will be punished. They just don't believe that that will be themselves. All right, but helping them see, hey, 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 stop comparing yourself to Hitler. All right, and that's what everyone seems to do. The worst person I know, I'm going to compare myself to them. And, well, I'm doing better than that guy. All right, so we compare ourselves to others, but helping people say, hey, hey, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to pass judgment on you. That's not my role but you're, you're comparing yourself to the wrong person. If you're basically just saying, I, I'm not a murderer like Jeffrey Dahmer, all right, okay, good. Why don't you compare yourself to Jesus Christ? If you had to, if you had to live up to that kind of standard, why don't you look in the Bible and see what Jesus did and what he didn't do? If you had to compare yourself to God, how well would you do? How, how much would you fall short of that? So instead of bringing judgment, we bring people saying, hey, why don't you look at comparing yourself to who it is you need to be compared to? Jesus' standard of heaven is not be better than a murderer. His standard is, hey, are you like my son Jesus Christ? Are you equal to him? And of course, when you begin to look at yourself that way, no way, I am terrible. I'm a terrible, horrible person. I, I am the worst. I love this story. I don't think I've shared this here before because I share it in my class sometimes. You know, mixed well. If I, I've already shared it with you, just sit there and just encourage me. Um, Matt Chandler has this illustration, uh, that something that happened with his own kids. Uh, and I really appreciate Matt. That He went to his uh, oldest, uh, his oldest daughter started asking him, like, hey, I, I'd like to... Uh, I want to trust Jesus as my Savior. And he's right around, she's right around the same age as, as Sicily. Sicily's starting to ask these kind of questions, starting to frame like who Jesus is, wanting to believe in Jesus. She says she believes in Jesus. She trusts in him. It's getting close. All right, so her oldest, her, his oldest daughter is like, yes, I want to trust uh, Jesus as my Savior. And he says, okay, well, who's the worst person in the house? All right, and she says, well, uh, that's Stephen. All right. And he's, she's like, what? He's like, yeah, he never obeys. You tell him to do stuff all the time, he, never, he always ignores you. He always yells no. He's like two years old. He always yells no. All right, yeah, he's the worst in the house. He's like, okay. All right, you're not ready yet. You're not ready to accept Jesus as your Savior. All right, and she's like, what? All right, and you expect a pastor to be like, oh, yeah, let's do this right now. Let's pray this prayer. But he goes and like, you're not ready yet. The next day he comes, she comes back. She's like, okay, I was thinking about, I, I really, Dad, I really, really want to trust Jesus as my Savior, he's like, oh, that's so exciting. Who's the worst person in the house? Matt. I think it's Matt. Because Matt's a little older, so Matt should know better. And the other day, he choked me. He choked me, and he didn't say he was sorry. All right? 
And she's like, he's like, oh, you're not ready yet. You're not ready. Two weeks go by. She comes back and says, Dad, it's me, isn't it? What? That's what you wanted me to say. That, like, who's the worst person? You want to say it's me, that it's me, right? Well, do you believe that? She's like, yeah, I think I'm the worst person in the house. I, I called, like, I can point out sin in my brothers, but I can't see it in myself. I, I'm the worst person. I know better. I, I need Jesus to be my Savior. It's like, okay, you're ready. <laughs> you're ready. All right? That's what the Holy Spirit does. It helps us not just see, all right, yeah, yeah, I need a little bit of help. Yeah, yeah, you know, I got a little, got a couple little stains that probably could use a little pre-wash. No, it's when you come before God and say, I am the worst sinner. I'm in need of a Savior. I cannot do this. I am destined for hell. I have done wrong in the sight of a holy God. That is when we are ready to say, yes, Lord, I want to trust you to be my Savior. I need you, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for rising from the dead. And thank you for just saying all I have to do is believe in you to be saved. When you see yourself as the worst, as the worst of all sinners, that's when you're ready. And that is what the Holy Spirit does. Now for the believer, and again, I'm not saying this is all he does. This is simply one passage in the totality of Scripture. He says, and I have many more things to say to you. Like you think Jesus' disciples spent three years with him, and he says, I got so much more to tell you. I can't bear them right now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. Uh, I sometimes joke a little bit that like the Holy Spirit is just kind of like the most forgotten person of the Trinity, that he gets kind of relegated to the side. There's the, the Father, the Son, and uh, that other guy. Uh, like that he definitely gets pushed aside, but I partly says like that the Holy Spirit wants it that way. Everything he does is to point people back to Jesus Christ. Everything Jesus is doing is to point people back to the Father. All right, that we see that the Holy Spirit's role is to say, all right, yes, the Lord gives him what he wants to communicate, what he wants to disclose to us. And I love that word because it's not usually this loud voice that's clear. It's, it's just disclosing it to us. He, he works with our own spirit to communicate to us what God wants in our life. He is leading us to all truth. All right, this is what the Holy Spirit does. He doesn't have his own agenda. All right, he's, tr he's not just trying to help you in your agenda. He is getting God's agenda through and communicating it through you in your life. And I actually think this is one of the hardest things to understand for me, and maybe it makes total sense to you. But for me, it's really tough. How can I see two godly people, all right, that they, they love God's word, they're close to him in prayer, and yet the Holy Spirit seems to lead them in different directions. I mean, we see this theologically. We can see people that are very, very godly line up on different sides of issues. We'll see people that are a little more Calvinistic or a little bit more free will. We'll see people that believe little different things about the end times, all right, than the way others. Like, how could if we all have the Holy Spirit? He's leading us and guiding us to truth. How could we end in different ends of the spectrum? Well, I think there's kind of a couple, you know, a couple frameworks. I was sharing this in Sunday school. I think many times we try to look at everything as, well, it's either this or this. It's either, it's either this side or this side. And God is saying, like, well, yes, you're, what you're looking at, you're correct. This is a side, and this is a side. And you're looking at this, like, dodecahedron that has, like, you know, multiple sides. And you're, oh, good little human. You understand this little tiny panel. All right? And this little human over here understands this little tiny panel. And they're arguing with each other. And they say, hold on, let me, let me get you a 10,000-foot view and let you see the whole picture. Oh, I am a three-dimensional creature trying to understand an infinitely dimensional God. I also think coming into play, in the way like Martin Luther would describe it, that we are all still dealing with the effects of sin. We are still in our flesh, and because of that, it, like the, the discerning of the Holy Spirit is always 
going to be fuzzy. It's always going to be slightly out of tune. We're going to pick up on little pieces of the message. Uh, I just dealt with a situation this week that I was meeting with two different students, both struggling with the same issue, both really seeming to put it to prayer and take time. They were both dealing with health insurance. All right? And in their search for the health insurance, they both started getting really convicted about that in, you know, in many of these health insurance plans are things that as Christians we would really disagree with. Things that we would really disagree with, like we do not want to fund abortions and we wouldn't necessarily want to fund, you know, like, um, you know, gender, um, you know, changing of a gender surgery. Um, there would be things in there that you can see it's in your plan you are paying for for other people. And they were both being convicted. And one was starting to look at like, hey, I saw MediShare and, and what it has to offer and that it's kind of a group of believers and they kind of cut a lot of that stuff out that we wouldn't believe in. We just pay this amount and it works for the healthcare law. And there's other ones looking at this, you know, looking at the same kind of thing and, and looking at the insurance they would get provided from their work and kind of weighing that to the cost. And as they started praying, it was just so funny, it kind of both came out this week. They'd been praying about it. They kind of started asking me some questions, just kind of framework. We looked at some things in scripture. And they came to different conclusions. They ended up doing different things. One ended up buying a MediShare, and one ended up going into uh, their TRICARE. Um, and when I look at that, I'm like, I, I didn't see anything, again, from the outside of, was the Holy Spirit guiding one one direction and one the other direction? Why would the Holy Spirit guide one in one way and another person in a different way? And so I really try to start thinking, like, I think there could be scenarios in which God is guiding this person and, and convicting him of certain things to guide them to this direction because this is the way he wanted him to go for something down the road. And maybe the other one, God has different plans and purposes. Something different is coming their way and they need this. They, God wants them to have this coverage and he's protecting them in that. I, I don't know. I don't know. And what, all I know is this. In your own personal life, they're going to be the only ones to know are they truly listening to the Holy Spirit in their life or are they doing what we do so often God, this is what I want, now bless it. All right, my favorite story from the, the Gospel in India, guys. They said the difference between American Christians and Christians in India is American Christians say, God, this is what I want to do, now bless it. And we use the Holy Spirit in our life that way. We're just saying like, all right, all right, Holy Spirit, give me a boost. All right, enhance it. You know, it's basically like, all right, let me put on some, you know, supernatural spiritual body armor, all right, that soups me up that makes me better at this Christian life. Whereas, you know, his noticing of Christians in any of what I think we should be closer to is just saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? God, what do you want from my life? I have no agenda but yours. So when I think about application, this is, this, when we think about the Holy Spirit, this is God with us. Not that you are God, but that he is in you. Not that you are not in control, but that you willingly humble your, your will to his. And we have the ultimate example of God himself, God the Holy Spirit. What God the Holy Spirit does has all the power, uh, all the authority, all the capability, and yet he chooses to be humble enough to spend his existence with you. That's pretty humble. All right? He is humble enough to say, uh, no, I, I'm not just going to tell you what I want to say. I am telling you what the Son, what Jesus Christ wants in your life, I will then communicate to you. You have the full humility of God in you. You have the ultimate example with you all the time. Can you really seek God's agenda for your life and not your own. So when I think about what that might look like, I threw out some kind of big crazy things like why would stress go down? How can we say that if we are truly yielded to the Holy Spirit in our life that our stress can go down? When we begin to realize that we are not holding the weight of the universe on our shoulders, but that we have the ability to pray, that we have the ability to commune with the creator of the universe, that he 
can hold the whole world in our hands, including all the stressors that might be laying on top of you. When I think about things even like debt, why would I throw out something like debt? When people talk about what stresses them out the most, uh, you know, I think it's seven out of ten people, it is there, it is the debt. The amount of debt they've collected is what stresses them the most. And when I think about what are some of the reasons, not all the reasons, you don't have to, I'm sure you can raise your hand and say, oh, but there was this one instance in which this debt didn't fall under this category. However, most of the time when I look at debt, it's because we want things and we want things now and we are not patient enough to wait on God's timing. That we are not patient enough to wait and say, God, are you going to provide this in some way? Is this something you really want me to have? And if it is, how are you going to provide it? I feel like it's a need in my life. Am I wrong here, God? Please guide me, direct me. If we really waited on God, I think the amount of credit card purchases, I think the amount of things that we put on five-year loans would just plummet when we started really waiting on God to provide. And when we begin to see those stressors begin to lift in our life, because it's like, God, I'm not living my life for my life. I'm not living my life for my purpose. I'm living my life for your kingdom and for your glory. When Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount he gets to lay out very simply, this is what it means to live for my kingdom, and this is what it means to live for your own kingdom. And your kingdom and my kingdom are in opposition to each other. They butt heads. We run out of time. Still 24-hour Christians live in a 24-hour day just like non-Christians. Christians have 365.4 days per year just like non-believers do. Uh, everybody deals with the same amount of time. And what Jesus says is if you seek me first and my righteousness, that all your other needs will be added unto you. How does that work? How does that begin to make sense? It's because God provides. And that is the direction that the Holy Spirit is leading us. And that's why hope is up. In Romans 5.5 5, he says, Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts, hearts on the side, right? Within our hearts, through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. It's not our literal hearts. All right, that the Holy Spirit was poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. God fills us with his hope. And his, the reason why Jesus has hope all the time, the reason why God is filled with hope, and if the Holy Spirit is filled with us, then we're filled with hope, is because God has this big picture. He has this full-on perspective. God knows it's not just that he's aware that he's going to win in the end. He says, I'm going to win it. All right, like, I have all the capability where I'm going to do this. All right, you are going to be victorious. There is heaven. You have a promised place there. The Holy Spirit is going to return to sender. The Holy Spirit is going to be spending eternity in heaven. And his spirit and our spirit are now one. And his spirit is going to spend an eternity in heaven. And our spirit will be there too. All right, and lastly, lives are going to be changed. And the reason why I know lives are going to be changed is this is what the Holy Spirit does in our life. And when we are interacting with other people, I know we all have people in our lives that we're like, why? How are they not changing? How are they still living this way? How are they doing this? How are they continuing on in that sin? How do they continue on not doing what's right? How can they continue to live they say things like, only God can judge me, and we're sitting there, that should terrify you. That should terrify you that God is going to judge you. And if we have the Holy Spirit in our life, and we're interacting with them, not only is the Spirit working on them, we are yield the Holy Spirit. Our words, <coughs> our external words, our external actions will be leading to the same thing. They will start to be changed, not because... We got great words and we have great actions, but because the God in us is great and awesome, they cannot help but be changed. You keep spending time with them. You keep loving them. You keep reaching out to them. You keep speaking truth into their life in love. Again, 
to what the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you to say. All right, you keep being there, and it got, the Holy Spirit will begin rattling around. I'm always so encouraged. I have to remind myself all the time, when you have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, when just those words get out, that, you know, Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead, let the Holy Spirit rattle that around in their life for the next few years. So maybe you get to come along again later. Maybe someone else will come along and get to kind of, kind of reap that harvest. But those are words that do not return void. God's words rip people apart because the Holy Spirit's role in this world is to convict the world for their, of their sin, of their righteousness, and of God's judgment. And as the praise team comes up, let us take a moment in prayer to really evaluate that in our life. Are we reflecting the Holy Spirit in this world? Are we reflecting the nature that is God that is within us? All right, when, when the Holy Spirit come, it radically changed who we were. We now have God in us. Not that we are God, that He is God and He is in us. All right, and we have God's words and desires and hopes and dreams and love and peace in us. That's why we can experience the fruits of the Spirit because that is what God experiences and He is in us. But is that coming to the, is that bubbling to the surface? Is that being lived out in our life? Is that being experienced in our everyday life? God, I pray you speak to each person here. Disclose to us, just using the word you used in your word, God. Disclose to us those areas that it is that we are all about ourself and not about you, where we are about our kingdom and not about your kingdom. God, reveal that in our life. Reveal where it is that we are not being obedient to the call that you have on our life. God, speak to me. God, 